Good morning. Welcome to service this morning for Faith Lutheran and our friends at Trinity Lutheran this morning. Um, we are awaiting the arrival of our interim pastor, Pastor Janine Olson, who is finishing up services out at the uh, Lake Hanska and Zion churches in Hanska, so she will be here shortly. Um, for those of you that are here, we enjoy seeing you in the pews. We will be having communion today, so hopefully you picked up your, your uh, little uh, communion cup and when you came in. For those of you that are home, I'm jealous. You're sitting in your robes and your blankets with your cup of coffee. Or today is actually National Hot Chocolate Day, so um, you know, enjoy that if you are watching from home. Um, just one announcement. Um, Next Sunday at 1 o'clock, we will be having our congregational meeting to vote on the call for a settled pastor. So 1 o'clock, it'll be in the parking lot. It'll be broadcast over the FM uh, station. So please, uh, please remember that. So Calvin Hansen from Trinity will be lighting our Advent candle and uh, doing the... Uh, uh, confession and forgiveness. So, Kelvin. Good morning. A special greeting to you from all of the members of Trinity Lutheran Church. Um, let us uh, begin the service by lighting the Advent candles, the candle of joy. In a world of despair, where depression rates run high, where there has been so much sadness and loss, God, we call upon you to come in a world where joy is a distant memory, we call upon you, great God of joy, to come. In this season of Advent, we wait for the coming of joy into our world. We await the birth of the anointed one, the promised child, who comes into our lives in a new way. Come, Messiah. Come and save us. Let us pray. Dear God, we pray for the joy that is found in Jesus, that those who seek it may truly find it. May we celebrate in the joy found in you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most 
most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with your whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Prepare the Royal Highway, verses 1 and 4. Is that better? Oh, look at that. So much better. Gospel, John chapter 1, beginning at uh, verse 6. Glory to you, O Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? 
He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, "Mm, no. They said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, why then are you baptizing, if you're neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, wasn't that a great way to welcome? Turn your mic on, Pastor. <laughs> which actually is kind of fitting. If you knew me better, I am, uh, how many of you here, raise your hands, and if you're worshiping from home, you can go ahead and raise your hands. The Holy Spirit will see you. Um, How many of you are random abstract? Like if I could put two hands up, I would. I am a random abstract person. My husband is so concrete, sequential, Well, I don't know how to finish that statement. He's just very not random abstract, so it's very challenging. And because I am that random personality, I have the ability to multitask. Who else is a multitasker here? See, there's a lot of us. Now, I embrace this quality, and I know that it helps me. But there are times when I envy my husband and other family and friends and colleagues who, are, who have that gift of compartmentalizing. You know what I mean when I say that? When you are a compartmentalizer, you can focus on whatever the task is right now, and all those other things you're worried about, you can put those in a box and set them on a shelf, and when it comes time, you'll just take that box down and worry about that. There are times, times when I would really love to be able to do that. Like when I'm gathered with a group of colleagues and I'm called to be professional. But my head is filled with the news that a family member did not survive his COVID virus. Compartmentalizing would have been really nice. Or when my family gathered for a big event safely. But it's hard to focus on the joining together because... I'm aware of just how many others that I know have lost their jobs or their businesses are in danger of being evicted. Yeah, compartmentalizing would be really handy. I imagine that John the Baptizer was wonderful at compartmentalizing because he was able to focus on his one task despite the many many distractions in his life. In fact, we call him John the Baptizer, and yet that's not what he called himself. He was pushed and pushed and pushed by the religious leaders of that day to identify himself. He didn't say, I'm the Baptizer. (laughs) That's not the title he gave himself. That's not the job description he gave himself. They wanted to know why he was baptizing. We call him the baptizer. But but John is very clear about his purpose and his identity. He has come to testify to the light, to make straight the way of the Lord. John's only purpose was to point others to Jesus. Period. End of story. Now that's why John baptized. The baptism wasn't his purpose. The baptism was one means by which he pointed others to Christ. When he said, when we hear the word repent, 
Now, I don't know y'all yet, so I don't know how comfortable you are talking in church. I know you're Lutheran, so it might not be that comfortable. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you a question, and I really mean it. You can answer. It's okay. So here's the question. What do you think of when you hear the word repent? How about a thumbs up? Is it a good word? Now, you're in church, so you're supposed to say it's good. Let's say you're not in church. If you heard the word repent, is it something you want to hear or not want to hear? Want to hear. You had something to say. Forgiveness. Repenting leads to forgiveness, yes. So we often think of that word repentance as putting on sackcloth and ashes and and bowing down and begging God to forgive me of whatever it was that I did. What if I were to tell you that's not what it means? What repenting means is to turn and to go another way. To stop doing whatever it was you were doing and to turn and go another way. And John really wanted, needed the people to turn and go another way because the way that they were going would not lead them to see the Messiah standing right in their midst. They lived in a time when Rome was the occupying nation. And as an occupier, they were, um, they were crushed. They were being crushed by injustice, blamed and killed for things they weren't responsible for. They were being taxed to the point of poverty and the inability to feed their families by this occupying force, this outsider's. They were dying of disease and they grieved the loss of not only their loved ones but their freedom as a nation. And so John was calling them to turn and to be counter-cultural, to be against this culture of grief and fear and injustice so that they would see someone who actually shows up with a different kind of message, a message of love and mercy and hope and joy. Because if they don't turn, they won't see him. They'll get caught up in all the distractions of the day. Does that sound familiar? (laughs) Each year we set aside four weeks, and we recognize each week by the lighting of a candle to prepare our own hearts and minds and to remind ourselves that this Savior who brings about this kingdom is indeed coming. This God is going to bring about a power that will destroy poverty, will destroy disease and injustice, and will turn grief into joy. The people who first heard this message needed that but you know what? (laughs) So do we. We might live in a wealthy nation, but this wealth is not shared. According to the Minnesota Defense Fund, 11% of our state's children live in poverty. 11%, that doesn't sound like a lot until you put numbers to it, and then it's somewhere around 150,000. 150,000 children in Minnesota. 43% of those, or somewhere near 65,000, are labeled extreme poverty. People, some of them live right here in Medelia. They're unsure of where they will find their next meal or whether or not mom or dad will be able to come home. Rampant disease? (laughs) Yeah, we got that too. We've learned a little something in these last few months, what it's like to live in quarantine. Did you ever figure you'd come to church in a mask? And wearing masks, while we may like it or not like it, 
The fact is, it protects our neighbor. Put our own interests aside. It protects the person God calls us to love, our neighbor. As we hear daily sick and death tolls rise, and this becomes our new normal. And while the reality of a new virus has taken its toll, people still suffer with cancer, heart disease, and all those other illnesses that cause grief, and take lives. Injustice? Oh yeah, we got that too. <laughs> this summer has like pulled the band-aid off something that, that people who look like me, who have very light skin, who are white, can uh, ignore. The sin of racism has been outed. White supremacists can no longer hide in plain sight. People looking at anyone created in the image of God, who, by the way, is every person on the planet, regardless of skin color, is created in the image of the holy God. Looking at that person as anything less than a beloved child of God has no place in Christ's church. Grief? Yeah, we have that too. More people from our nation have died in our communities and families from this one virus than lost their lives from our nation in World War II. We are a nation grieving. And yet I believe that those realities of poverty and disease and injustice and grief become a distraction themselves, taking our eyes off the promises of Christ, of love and hope, and turning us towards the pain of grief and death. We continue to need that bold voice of John the baptizer, John the testifier to the light, that will stand in the midst of all those distractions and will point us to Jesus. So praise God. We have that testifier, and I'm looking at her and him. You, church, you, are the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You have the task of being the one to point others to Christ. In your baptism, God called you by name and claimed you as a disciple of Jesus Christ, marking you with the cross of Christ and sealing you with the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that you might be the hands and the feet and the voice of of Christ. Part of our job as baptized children of God is to point others to the light in the midst of this darkness. Have you ever been somewhere that's completely devoid of light? There's no, there's no little glimmer coming from a beautiful stained glass or nothing seeping under a crack or anybody? I have. I was 13, which if you ask any one of my eight grandchildren, it was a really long time ago. And I was on a family trip with my parents and my younger brother and my grandparents. We were in Tennessee, and we visited the Cumberland Caverns, and this experience must have made a great impression because I remember it so clearly even today. Sometime during that guided tour, all the lights, all the headlamps were distinguished, extinguished. And it became so dark that that phrase, you can't see your hand in front of your face, became real to me. No matter how hard I squinted and tried, I could not find a glimmer of light to allow me to even see my hand. And then the tour guide lit one match. You know that feeling when someone turns the light on and you're not ready after you woke up? It's blinding. That's what one match did in this huge cavern. People of God, if one match can light a cavern, 
What can all of you, sitting here and worshiping online, what can all of you do right here in Medelia? What can your light, how much joy and hope in the midst of darkness and grief can you bring? Because that's our call, to speak that one word of hope to people who have lost their hope. We've all experienced the light of Christ shining in our own darkness. In 1998, my first husband died. And the morning of his death, uh, someone walked into our sunroom where it was August, I was sitting, and I had no idea I needed to see someone. I really had no idea I needed anything, and she walked in the room, and my spirit was lifted. And I could have, I did thank her, but I thanked her, Ellen, for hearing the voice of God in that moment and responding. You see, the Holy Spirit taps us on the shoulder often and says, you know that person down the street, they could really use a phone call. And our Scandinavian, Germanic, Lutheran selves say, oh, I don't want to be a bother. Oh, they don't want to hear from me. Yes, they do. The Holy Spirit is calling you to reach out and just be that voice of love in a time of darkness for that person. You don't know what darkness they're walking through, but God does. You might be tapped on the shoulder and said, you know, you could go down to the grocery store and pick up a bag of groceries, just leave it on their doorstep, don't even ring the doorbell. Because you know they've both lost their jobs. And they've got four kids. And whether they say they need it or not, you know they need it. Don't ask for recognition. Just be that light of Christ shining in the darkness. You see, when you were baptized, a a, a pastor gave to your parent a candle and said these words, let your light so shine before others that they will see your good works and give glory to God. They will see your good works, and your good works will testify to a loving God. That's our job. Like John the baptizer. Oh, dear friends, what a joy-filled job we have to share God's light and love and peace with everyone around us. Everyone. (laughs) No exceptions. Stir us up, O Christ, and come, that we might share your light with the world. And all God's people said, Amen. We sing our next hymn. Christ, announce 
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for all people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of preachers and messengers, you have given the work of proclaiming good news of Jesus Christ to leaders of your church. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Be with the call committee and leaders who are tasked with finding new preachers and teachers for faith and Trinity Lutheran churches. Embed your word in their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, God of all peoples and nations, you placed us in this place at this time and ask us to care for all people around us, those we know and those we don't know. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Lord, in your mercy, God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what was once destroyed. We pray for people of Haines, Alaska, Central Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand, who are left without shelter and are mourning the loss of life due to torrential rain and landslides. Support the work of Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Disaster Response, and all our disaster relief organizations in their recovery efforts. Lord, in your mercy, God of the powerful and help and helpless, you clothe us with the strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your Holy Spirit upon the people of faith and trinity. Empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need. Be with all those we know and love who are ill and mourning. This morning we especially pray for Sybil Christensen and all of her family on the loss of Everett. Dear Lord, transform us into your church and make us a place of refuge and healing. Lord, in your mercy. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testified to your radiant love. Be with all those who have lost loved ones and those who have lost loved ones whom we don't know. 
Make us witnesses to the joy that comes from you, Lord, in your mercy. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us exchange a measure of that peace with one another by a wave. In the order for church to be church, God calls us to share from our resources, our time, and our treasure. This time uh, for offering, there is an offering plate in the back as you leave, and one is marked for Trinity, and one is marked for faith. Isn't that something new? (laughs) Ha ha, who said Lutherans can't change? And many of you might already be contributing uh, online through Simply Giving. If you would like to know more about that, please contact the office of either Trinity or Faith. And now we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the Holy Meal. If you are worshiping at home, please gather the supplies you need. Please gather the supplies of bread and wine or grape juice. And know that in this holy meal, time doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit gathers all the whole church from all time. And space doesn't matter. We are one body of Christ meeting virtually and in person. And so we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered together in this place and virtually, we remember the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now I notice some of you have already consumed the elements. That's fine. Jesus doesn't care when we do it, okay? Um, This was my practice, is to share together the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his peace. Amen. And now receive this benediction. As you leave this place, know that the grace, the peace, and the love of God go with you now and remain with you forever. Amen. We sing verses 1 and 4 of our sending song. Every 
การ